Hello guys, I welcome you all to Insult Kari. So we'll be taking up the important articles for the UPSC Civil Services examination from the important newspapers that we discuss on everyday basis. So it is going to be for 26th of March 2023. So we've been seeing that Rahul Gandhi has been disqualified from the parliament and since uh, he's been disqualified, so all the important constitutional articles, important Supreme Court judgments, the schedule of the constitution, all of that related to disqualification becomes very important. And so uh, obviously this issue has taken a political tone, so that is not important for us. So in a hill state, point and shoot plastic so management of plastic waste how we can recycle it where it can be recycled is important and Uttarakhand basically it is implementing a QR code based project to prevent littering the Chardam route with plastic bottles and packets so let's understand what kind of model they are coming up with as far as tackling with plastic waste is concerned so The Hemkund Saib and the Valley of Flowers will also see the implementation of this QR code based system that will streamline collection of waste and reduction of garbage along the route. So visitors, they will scan a QR code on each plastic bottle and multi-layer plastic bag and they will pay a deposit over the maximum retail price. So they can claim this amount back as a refund when they deposit the waste at a point at the end of the Yatra. And up to 45 lakh QR codes are expected to be printed this year. So basically whatever like packaging material that has been uh, like in the form of plastic, be it plastic water bottles and even the uh, wrapper of biscuits and different food items. So they'll be having a printed QR code and that would be scanned by different pilgrims. So if that matches with the ways that you deposit finally in the dustbins, so you will be getting some token amount which you can later on refund. And that's how basically the administration is trying to manage to collect the plastic waste and keep the environment clean. So be vigilant against the interest rate risks, uh, our union finance minister tells the banks. So amid the fears of contagion effects from the banking crisis in the US and Europe, our Union Finance Minister Nimala Sitaraman has asked banks to remain vigilant against the interest rate risks and undertake regular stress tests. Even as the public sector bankers, they have assured her that all the possible steps that are being taken to safeguard themselves from any potential financial stock uh, as far as Indian banks are concerned. So she chaired a review of the public sector bank's performance and she also urged banks to try attracting more deposits now that the government has reduced the tax arbitrage in some debt instruments, uh, hinting at the finance bill changes to strip some of the tax benefits that are available to the debt mutual funds from April 1. So now, um, basically, she's saying that banks, they need to you know, mop up more of uh, bank deposits, the demand deposits with them. And here, when we are talking about the interest rate risk, so whenever there is, yesterday also we talked about uh, the effect on India whenever we see that the Fed it increases its policy rate is that the investors, they exit from the Indian capital market and they start investing in the USA's capital market because they find it a safer option. So that is the main impact. And here, this is, uh, we can also say it in other terms uh, as interest rate risk. So that is one thing. And it is obviously very important since two major banks, they have failed. And this is obviously one of the largest after the 2008 financial crisis. So it is important to monitor the health of the Indian banks, the commercial banks, the public sector banks, even in India, in order to safeguard the interest of the depositors, the bankers, the banks, and also the entire financial system, entire banking system in India.
moving forward, everything is like air is political news, so we'll not be going into that. So significant drop has been achieved in EPF's actuarial deficit. This has been informed by the central government in the parliament. So a significant drop has been achieved in the actuarial deficit of the employees' pension fund. And this has become possible, by, uh, possible thanks to the improvement in the quality of data in respect of the members of the employees' pension uh, 1995 and amendments that were carried out based on the recommendations of the actuarial valuation report. So the Union Finance Ministry is agreeing to the minimum pension proposal. Since September 1, 2014, a minimum pension of rupees 1,000 per month under the EPS that is being provided through the budgetary support. So this is the minimum amount of pension of rupees 1,000. And apart from that, among the amendments were the calculations of the pensionable salary on the basis of 60 months average instead of the 12 months. So some changes have been done in the formula, which is used to calculate the pension, the pensionable salary. So that is uh, one of the changes. So it's an annuity-based scheme as regards the suggestion for conducting the valuation every three years and replacing the EPS with a Provident Fund Compension Annuity Scheme over the mandatory annu annuitization. The ATR mentioned that no consensus could emerge on the proposal for an annuity-based scheme during two meetings of the Central Board of Trustees of the EPF. And it was spelled that the annual valuation should continue. So you can find out more about the changes and if there is any committee, the name of the committee becomes important and also find out about uh, the definition of the actuarial deficit because that has not been mentioned in this particular article. So that is important for us from the perspective of the examination. So AFSWA areas have been further reduced owing to the improved security situation. So Armed Forces Special Powers Act it is there in the northeastern states. So Union Home Minister said that the center it has decided to reduce the disturbed areas under the AFSWA Act. And states like Nagaland, Assam and Manipur due to the significant improvement in the security situation in northeast India. So we need to know about some of the provisions, important provisions uh, of the ASPA Act. And right now it is it is functioning or it is uh, under implementation in which all states. And then what are the conditions under which this act is implemented, even that are important. So that is important for the perspective of examination for us. So compared to the year 2014, there is a reduction of 76% in the extremist incidents in the year 2022. And similarly, the deaths of the security personnel and civilians that has also come down by 90% and 97% respectively. So we are seeing an improvement in the security situation. So that's why the disturbed, uh, the declared disturbed areas that would be reduced and consequently the AFSA Act would be revoked from that particular areas and the disturbed area notification under the ASPA was completely withdrawn from Tripura in 2015 and Meghalaya in 2018 so not like ASPA is not there it is not implemented in Tripura and Meghalaya right now so we need to remember this thing Tripura and Meghalaya
So lights were turned off in various cities to mark the Earth R and they were turned off between 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. as part of the Global Earth Hour event that is held every year. So this annual event is observed in order to raise the awareness of energy conservation. So lights at Rashtrapati Bhavan and also the famous Akshadan Temple in New Delhi, they were also turned off in support of nature and the planet on Saturday. So this is an exercise to increase more awareness about energy, uh, about energy conservation. So if your lights are switched on and basically they're not being used so you need to make sure that you turn them off so india's first cable state railway bridge is nearing its completion so since it is india's first cable state railway bridge so it becomes important so the bridge is supported by a single pylon soaring 1,086 feet from the Anjikhad riverbed in the Riyasi district. So it is there in Jammu and Kashmir Union Territory. So the name is Anjikhad Bridge in Riyasi district of Jammu. It is a major chink in the Indian Railway's ambitious plan to connect Kashmir to Jammu and the rest of India seamlessly. Coming to the world news, Russia will station tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. So firstly, we need to have clear idea about the location of Belarus and important conventions which are related to nuclear weapons, their usage and the treaties and in the context of India, India is signatory to which all of them. So moving forward, we see that Britain and nine partners, they train the Ukraine military recruits. So as we know, NATO countries supporting Ukraine in this war. So operation has been named Interflex. It is a part of the UK's commitment of 2.3 billion pounds for military aid and support to Ukraine. And the five week course is being undertaken at four locations across different countries. So tornadoes, they ripped through Mississippi, killing 23, injuring dozens overnight. So from the perspective of the civil services examination, we need to know that whether tornadoes, uh, do they occur in India or not? And then what are the climatic conditions which are important for their formation? So that is uh, only the important information that we need to know about this thing. So new technique, it can say where spent nuclear fuel came from. So scientists in China, they have developed a technique to, uh, to reliably identify whether some nuclear fuel originated in one of the two common kinds of nuclear reactors or difficult task in the nuclear forensics using the experimental data and the machine learning. So they've devised a new technique through which they can know this thing. And right now, the nuclear forensics, they use the analytical methods to identify the origins of the nuclear materials and whether they were used for military applications or not. So spent fuel from the boiling water reactors is hard to differentiate from that from the pressurized water reactors. So from the perspective of the examination, uh, it is important for uh, us to know India's complete journey and evolution of the nuclear technology, which types of nuclear of, like plants do we have and they have been set up in collaboration with which country so that is important and how they are different from like the other techniques like we have pressurized heavy water reactors in India we have the boiling water reactors so that is important for us to know so inadequate sleep it increases the risk of fatty liver disease so it is important 
every day to have adequate and good amount of quality sleep because it is really very, very important for our good health. So with every one hour decrease in sleep time from the recommended seven to eight hours, the risk of fat deposition in the liver increased by 24%. So the adequate amount of sleep that you need to take every day should be between seven to eight hours and it shouldn't be less than that because then the risk of the fatty liver disease, disease it increases by 24 percentage which is very huge so health is wealth as we know so it's important that you take quality sleep every single day so the brain does not rest during sleep but is it is engaged in various activities necessary to improve our well-being especially of the liver an incidence of the fatty liver disease among 10,000 people with sleep disorders at one year follow-up was 14, and control group recorded only six cases. So inadequate sleep duration is strongly associated with an elevated risk of developing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and napping for more than one hour during the day, too, was strongly associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease development. Apart from that, liver fat content in sleep-deprived mice increased without total weight gain compared to the control group. And also the risk of the fatty liver disease reduced significantly in people who caught up on sleep debt during the weekends. So these were different scenarios which were analyzed. So sleep definitely, it is a vital function of human life and it accounts for up to one third of the lifespan. So contrary to the normal belief, during sleep, the brain is not resting, but it is engaged in various important activities. Oxytocin, it plays a key role in the basic empathy in zebra fish. So oxytocin, it plays an essential role in the spread of fear in the zebrafish. The results also would suggest a deeply conserved role for the hormone in emotional contagion and among the vertebrates like fish. So empathy, which is the capacity to recognize and respond to the emotional state of another individual is a hallmark of highly social mammals. So we are seeing that COVID-19 cases are increasing. So is it a really a cause of worry or not is the main question. So recently, a prime minister also held a high-level meeting on COVID-19 task force. So this is for the first time this year that such a meeting it has been convened. And because the cases have been increasing, so that's why it is important to monitor and assess the situation. So... Looking at what was the outcome of this meeting, so the headline remark was that COVID-19 pandemic, it is far from over and a prime minister stressed the need to monitor the status of the disease across the country on a regular basis. So he directed officials to increase the whole genome sequencing COVID-19 positive samples. So this is important for us to know more about the whole genome sequencing and that is basically using the designated InsaCoG, that is Indian SARS-CoV-2 Genomics Consortium Laboratories, would be used for this to aid with the tracking of the new and emerging variants and facilitate a timely response towards that. So consortium is a network of labs across the country that analyzes samples from different regions and sounds and alert if a spike in cases is linked to certain mutations of the coronavirus. So what is the reason behind the surge in cases right now? So there is an increase in the number of seasonal influenza H3N2 cases and the tests on patients often reveal an uptick in the COVID-19 cases. So basically the tests are not being, basically they've been not being conducted for checking whether COVID-19 cases are increasing or not. The main purpose was because of the rise in cases of influenza H3N2. And that's where we came to know about that even the COVID-19 cases are increasing. So a rapidly proliferating lineage of the Omicron virus called the XBB.1.16, that is right now, believed to uh, be behind the recent spike in the cases.
So will the mega textile parks help boost the sector or not is the main question. So recently there's the scheme that is PM Mitra scheme, which is associated with setting up of textile parks. So what are the mega parks which are coming up in the first phase of this PM Mitra scheme, which has been the reaction to the announcement from the MSMEs, which dominates the textiles and apparel industry? And how is this initiative different from the Osla or the earlier textile park schemes? So India, it must take a cue from the country such as Turkey, where integrated textile parks, they are highly efficient. So we can take lessons from countries like these. And the notification for the large-scale textile parks under PM Mitra, it had been given in October 2021. So the scheme, it seeks to streamline the textile value chain into one ecosystem taking in spinning, weaving and dyeing to printing and garment manufacturing. So all of that thing would be happening at one place so that even the entire supply chain becomes much more efficient and the even the cost of production that also reduces. So that is going to be the main benefit of setting up the textile parks. So what is expected in the first phase of this? So uh, under the first phase of PM Mitra large textile parks, they'll be spread across at least 1,000 acres. They will be set up in only seven states as of now. So you need to remember that they're not coming up in all the states. In the first phase, they are coming up in seven states, which includes Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Telangana, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Gujarat, and Uttar Pradesh. So they'll be housing the entire textile value chain from fiber to fabric to garments. So the parks, they will have plug and play manufacturing facilities and all the common amenities that would be required. So how is it different from the earlier initiatives is that it is a unique initiative and the differentiating factors are the emphasis on the large scale production and the provision of plug and play manufacturing centers. So these are the unique things in the PM Mitra scheme right now and the scheme it is to be implemented jointly by the central and the state government so that is also one of the different points and the parks which will be open for the foreign direct investment they will be located in states that have inherent strengths in the textile sector so basically step uh, in the direction of strengthening the sector further and each park, it will have a fluent treatment plants, accommodation uh, accommodation for the workers, skill training centers would be there, warehouses too would be there in these parks itself. So what will be the impact on MSMEs since uh, the MSMEs, they dominate the textile sectors in India? So MSME sector, it is said to control almost 80% of the textiles and apparents currently which are made in India. So 80% dominance is of MSMEs. And further, the Indian textile and the clothing units, they are more cotton-based. So the industry has mixed views on the immediate impact of the huge investments that are expected to come into the parks and the existing units. And however, with the mounting challenges, such as the global geopolitical situation, that is how things are reordering and the overseas buyers exploring China, as well as other sourcing options, the past years, it has seen notable shifts in the supply chain also. So these are the challenges that whenever we look at the demand of the foreign buyers, they are exploring other options in China and in other markets. So the orders, they are transitioning to suppliers who are highly price competitive and they have sustainable production process. So two important points which needs to be kept in mind if we want our, our, our textile sector to become competitive globally is that it needs to be highly price competitive. It needs to be the quality of the textile needs to be really good. And the second uh, emphasis needs to be upon the process. So the process of production that needs to be sustainable. So we have already discussed about this thing that India's rejected J&J's patent on the TB drugs and now will be like the drug, it would be eligible to be produced as a generic medicines where India definitely enjoys certain kind of advantage. 
So how will it help the treatment of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and what are the cost and production implications of this decision and how many people they suffer from multi-drug resistance TB in India? What is India's target year to eliminate TB? So the target year is 2025. This needs to be in your mind very clearly and you need not get confused that it is not 2030 for India. It is 2025. And we need to have clear idea about what is the meaning or what do we mean by the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So because of the over usage of the drugs, even the bacteria. So TB is caused by a bacteria. So the bacteria, it becomes in it becomes unresponsive towards the drug in dose because then a body becomes unresponsive because of too much, too much usage of the drug. So that is multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So... That is a challenge in treating TB or the tuberculosis. And MDR TB, it resists the treatments by at least two frontline drugs in the TB treatment. So when the two common drugs used are isoniazid and rifampicin. So uh, in the multi-drug resistant TB, the resistance is developed against these two drugs, which I just mentioned. And there are other drugs also, so you can see the names have been mentioned over here. We're seeing that TB incidence in India, it has been on the decline, but the multi-drug resistant TB and XCR, they endanger the initiatives to locally eradicate this disease. So that is one trend that we are seeing. So how is this drug resistant TB treated? is the main challenge so it's an infection the bacterium mycobacterium tuberculosis which causes tb in lungs but often in other organs as well so you need to have clarity about this also that tb is not just related to lungs it can even happen in other body organs so it can be treated by strictly adhering to the doses and the frequencies of the drugs which are prescribed by physician it is very important and deviations from this schedule it can lead the bacteria to become drug resistant so it is important to stick to the schedule, the timings and the frequencies that are prescribed by your physician. So yet they happen because the drugs, they often they have side effects that diminishes the quality of life for because patients, they have been afforded access to the requisite drugs on time. So these are certain reasons and Moving forward. So MSMEs, they are not static, but they are growing in size in India. And there's evidence of upward intercategory mobility among the manufacturing and the service units. So we are, we are seeing an expansion in the MSME sector also. So we have the Udyam portal, which is related to the MSMEs. And this is enabling the MSME firms to register themselves on the Udyam portal. So making the exercise much more easier and transparent for them. And also it would be helping reducing the corruption. So we need to remember that Udyam portal is related to registration of the MSMEs. Taking up Financial Express now. So we have seen that finance minister has urged the public sector banks to be much more vigilant because of the global financial situation that we are seeing majorly because of the failure of two banks in US and Europe. So taking stock amid the bank crisis in US and Europe. So uh, she asked them to attract more deposits given that tax parity of the FDs with the debt funds. So financially well robust, she emphasizes the focus on risk management, diversification of the deposits and the asset space. So whenever we talk about 
risk aversion it the main important thing is diversification so it is not important that whenever you are even taking any decision about investment you are putting your entire money in just one thing if you want to reduce your risk it is important that you diversify your investment decisions and that's how you will be able to safely invest in diverse areas so she advises to frame detailed crisis management and communication strategies and the PSB CEOs, they assure that all major financial parameters, they are stable. The PSBs, they are in robust financial health in India. So small town India is becoming a big, it is becoming a big draw for major hospitality players. So we've been talking about rural tourism. We've been talking about uh, the tourism in border areas. So we are seeing that small towns are attracting more tourists in India and almost 50% of the planned hotels, they're concentrated in tier two and tier three markets. So we're seeing government versus judiciary over the collision system. So since then, we have been seeing that remarks have been coming from both the sides. So the union law minister says that differences does not mean a confrontation. It sends a wrong message across the world. So there is no confrontation between the government and judiciary. And... He denied of any clash between the government and judiciary as a, as a speculated in media and contended that differences were inevitable in a democracy, but they should not be construed as a confrontation. So he says that it is absolutely right to put up your opinion. And if there is any difference of opinion, so it does not mean that you are at confrontation against each other. So CJ says that there is an abysmal woman to men ratio in the legal profession. So we've been talking about this thing that the role of women, it needs to increase in the professional sphere in the employment sector. And even CJ lacked the abysmal woman to men ratio in the legal profession also. And he called for ensuring equal opportunities for women, asserting that there was no dearth of young, talented women lawyers in India. So there's going to be a nationwide COVID drill on 10th and 11th of April. And this is going to be uh, an exercise for taking the stock of the hospital's preparedness level. Even if like uh, in future, if there is any incidence of huge spike in the COVID-19 cases, so it is important to, you know, be prepared for any such incidents in future or any event like this. So G20 Chennai FWG meet, it stressed on the efforts to manage global inflation. And yesterday also we saw that inflation is one of the global macro issues, which is right now causing a concern globally. So managing it is very important. We talked about the elasticity of inflation vis-a-vis -vis the rate hikes that are being done by different central banks across different countries. So that is a concern and recently we saw that US Fed has also increased the policy rate. Coming to Indian Express, uh, India wins two goals and it eyes, they are now set on two more today. So we see that women they are winning and this is in the context of women's world boxing championship that we won two goals so moments after being crowned world champions neetu gangas she's 22 he ran to india's national coach bhaskar bhatt and wept in his arms and swati bora she's 30 she pumped her face to the camera called for an indian flag and waved it so we won two gold medals. They were at stake for India, the Women's World Boxing Championship. So we saw in the Hindu that Aswa is not there in Tripura and Meghalaya. 
And this is the second time in a year that the center rate has reduced the areas under ASFA in the three states. And earlier, the center had significantly reduced ASFA footprint after the outrage over the Mon killings in Nagaland in December 2021. So there's a GST composition scheme. So whose aggregate annual turnover is up to a specified limit, they can opt for this GST composition scheme by 31st of March, 2023. So the eligible taxpayers who wish to avail the composition scheme, they may opt for the same by performing the following steps on the GST portal. So you can go ahead and just have a look at what the different steps if you fall in this category. So what are the benefits of the uh, composition scheme so it is easy and convenient and compliant Co there's convenient compliance it would attractive uh, you will be having attractive tax rates it will be available for the supplier of the goods as well as the services so this is important for us to remember it is there for both goods and services there is auto renewal and there it is easy to even opt out of it then there is minimum compliance requirements and there is less bookkeeping so that's there. So we need to have a look at the limits. So here it is, the table is mentioning the type of the suppliers and the aggregate annual turnover during the current financial year. So the supplier of goods, there are two categories, the taxpayers, which are registered in eight specified states. If the limit is up to rupees 75 lakh, your annual turnover is up to 75 lakh rupees. So you fall in this category and you can avail the benefits under this compensation scheme and the taxpayer which are registered in the other states and where their turnover annual turnover is up to rupees 1 lakh 50 thousand one sorry 150 lakh rupees you can again avail the benefits and in case of the supplier of services if your annual turnover is rupees 50 lakhs or less you can avail the benefits So we've already discussed these things in the end we will not them will not take them up again so we see that as liquidity tightens the rbi it infuses around rupees 7.89 lakh crore rupees between march 15 to 23 so liquidity tightens basically the supply of money is reducing so because of that this amount of money it has been infused it has been made available by rbis in order to keep the situation stable and on 24th of March, banks they borrowed rupees 55,000 crores from a five day variable repo rate auction. So, as liquidity in the banking system it slipped into deficit, RBI it has infused money and that is to meet the higher capital requirements of the bank. So, the tightness in the liquidity condition was mainly due to the outflows related to the payment of the advance tax. And the last date for which is 15th of March. So because of this reason, we are seeing that there was a liquidity crunch. And the payment of the GST tax before 20th of March also weighed on the liquidity situation of the banks. So these are the reasons. And then RBI came to the rescue of the banks. In order to keep the situation disciplined and stable.
So that's all for today. Thank you for joining in Sarkari. And there, there's also a PDF link in the description box. You can go through that for your revision purpose. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscription button and also hit the like button for this video. Apart from that, share it as much as possible with your friends and fellows. And thank you so much for joining us for today.